I will just take it to UK and we just fix it in with UK. So it's the one on the bottom. No way. Oh, there we go. All right. Hope everyone uh, got hydrated and used the restroom and checked out the Ginkgo Cafe, or they might be closed now. So, um, we're getting ready to start our present uh, day portion of um, our speakers today. We've got some really great um, speakers for you all. All are currently involved in the pilot program producing uh, Kentucky hemp products and uh, will be able to give you an overview of some of the potential opportunities that are out there today. Um, anywhere from creating this hemp oil and this hemp protein um, here to um, biocomposite, CBD, um, there's all sorts of um, potential markets which we sort of discussed um, and, and all of them will be able to give you a nice overview of what their interests are, um, what they're involved in and how you can potentially get involved as well. So I'd like to get started with our first speaker who is near and dear to my heart. Um, we met Katie in 2014. Um, she was participating in the pilot program um, in Hopkinsville, Kentucky, and we are not too, we were not too far at the time. We were from Murray, Kentucky, so um, we were actually able to help her harvest and, and work with her for a little bit before we headed um, to Lexington and moved here. So the crop you see here today is actually um, what Katie grew at her farm in 2014 and we harvested together and we've actually had it um, in a storage unit in our garage in Shelbyville for about six months now and, and we were excited to get some of these bundles out and show you all today um, not only what the stock looks like even if it has been a little broken up and a little bit but how, how durable it is and how long it is able to last and, and this could still be used today so uh, I'll go ahead and let Katie take over the mic let's all give her a big round of applause y'all don't mind if I wear my hat because I, I pretty much um, committed to it when I put it on. If I take it off now, it's hat hair for everyone. So, um, But I'm in Lexington, so what better place to talk about hemp and wear a big floppy hat and a sundress. It's perfect. Um, my name is Katie Moyer. I am the uh, principal or owner of Kentucky Hemp Works. We are located in Christian County. Is anybody is anybody familiar with Hoptown? Anybody know where Hoptown is here? Anybody from Hoptown? Okay, <laughs> so just me. Um, well, that's great. So y'all know where Hoptown is. You know that Christian County is, is the largest ag county in the state. So we do uh, a lot of grain, a lot of tobacco, uh, a lot of experimental crops like sorghum, uh, canola. There, just basically anything that they can find to, you know, replace an acre or rotate an acre here or rotate an acre there, they're looking to do it. So, so we are in a really good area and a really um, ripe position in the middle of this huge agriculture community to, to really take it to the next level. So, um, so the girls, uh, Alyssa and Kirsten, asked me to talk a little bit about my history with the, the hemp movement in Kentucky as well as where we're going in the future and and so I do want to talk a little bit about that but I also want to talk a little bit about how everybody here can get involved and and help bring this crop to all US farmers because right now you know if you're just some random girl from Hoptown you can do big things and I mean eight years ago that's exactly what I was I was a random girl from Hoptown I had no experience with hemp whatsoever uh, I saw a video on YouTube that said, uh, you know, it was Ron Paul. He was running for president at the time. This was a 2008 election. And he said, you know, we should be talking about hemp. Hemp is seven times more efficient for making ethanol than corn is. And so to me, that kind of blew my mind because we, we had an ethanol plant there in Christian County. It was a cooperative effort with the farmers there. The farmers would grow the corn. They sell it right to the ethanol plant and they know where they're going with their crops. So to me, it kind of struck home, and I thought, oh, well, why aren't we growing hemp in Christian County and using it for ethanol? So I did a little digging, because at the time, I thought I thought hemp was necklaces and t-shirts, and that was it. Uh, I, I didn't have a clue. Um, but YouTube, the internet, there's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of information out there that you have to take with a grain of salt, and you have to do a little more digging and you have to find out what, what, you know, find that little speck of truth in what you found in the YouTube video. But there's a lot out there. <clears throat> and it really helped me to go from 
uh, okay, hemp is for necklaces and t-shirts to, wow, so we can make diesel fuel and ethanol and concrete and, and all these different products. So, you know, that was a, that was a huge thing. But then, you know, some other things happened. Um, I, I got involved in uh, some of the political happenings in Kentucky. I sort of started to take an interest in it. And uh, just, just showing up and being involved and, and taking an interest in these things led me to meet certain people that already had experience with hemp. They'd already been educating people about hemp for decades. Uh, we are in Lexington. How many people here are familiar with a gentleman named Gatewood Galbraith? Yeah. Anybody know Gatewood? Okay. So if you know Gatewood, you know that one of his big issues was legalizing cannabis. And he didn't care what kind of cannabis you were talking about. He wanted hemp. He wanted the, the cousin. He wanted all of it. But if you listen to him, and you listen to him talk about hemp, and talk about the differences between the two crops and why we had to be growing hemp in Kentucky, and the history of Kentucky, uh, and, and hemp in Kentucky, you know, whether you agree with him or disagree with him politically, and quite frankly, I didn't agree with him down the line on everything, but when you listen to him, you know that the man, is, he was bright, he was way ahead of his time, and he had been educating people about this crop uh, long before it became popular. Um, so Gatewood was one of those people. I learned a lot about hemp from his, from his book, from meeting with him. Uh, Craig Lee was another. Anybody in here know who Craig Lee is? We got one in the back. I know there's some of y'all know Craig Lee back here. Um, Craig Lee was another one. Craig Lee actually, uh, he reinstated a, a corporation that was originally founded by Henry Clay. So back in, I don't know, what, the 40s, 1941, 42, sometime around there, Henry Clay created the Kentucky Industrial, or the Kentucky Hemp Growers Cooperative. And uh, so, you know, after he passed, and, and of course hemp became, uh, hemp was prohibited and things like that, you know, that corporation went defunct. And he reinstated that corporation, and. Um, you know, traveled, traveled the country really, educating people and talking to people about him. So, you know, I had a lot of really good educators to draw from. So it wasn't just information I was getting from YouTube. Now I was taking all the little bits of truth that I got off the internet and getting to the, the real truth and the underlying meanings to all of it. So I was getting a very thorough education and so decided, you know, what, what better to do? You know, I'm collecting hemp products. I, I've got little raw materials here and there, and I've got all this cool stuff made out of hemp. How am I going to get this out to the public? So, you know, once again, um, you know, and I'll just t break to say that one of my favorite quotes that, that I've ever heard, and I can't even pinpoint who said it, but he said, the world is run by those who show up. And that's something that really resonated with me because in, until you actually do get involved and start showing up to meetings, whether it's a political meeting or a hemp meeting or your local 4-H group, you know, that, that's the people that run the world are the people who show up and get out of bed in the morning and say, I'm going to go do something big with my life today. So <clears throat> going back to, you know, my involvement in the early end of it, you know, I decided, well, what am I going to do with this? Well, it's time to show up. Let's do a seminar in Hopkinsville. And that's kind of what started it all. Um, we organized a seminar. We got the uh, uh, com previous commissioner of agriculture, James Comer, who had just recently been elected to his position. Uh, we had already talked about him, uh, talked to him about him. We had already educated him about it. So he pulled a, a big 180 on the issue. And he showed up at this seminar. We had local elected officials. Our, our state senator at the time, Joey Pendleton, uh, was the initial co-sponsor for the hemp bill. So we had asked him to co-sponsor the or we had asked him to sponsor the legislation. And he so he was there. He was speaking. We had our county historian come and speak. Uh, we had a gentleman, uh, Mr. Wimpy. Uh, if you're in Christian County, you know you know the Wimpy family, and you know Mr. Wimpy. He's no longer with us, but at the time of the seminar. He was just a few weeks away from his 100th birthday. He had grown hemp. He had grown hemp with his family, um, cut it, planted it, hard, I mean, did all the, the whole gamut, 
and uh, and he actually came and showed up to that seminar as well. And so we have products out on the table. We we had lots of speakers. We showed some videos, and it just sort of became one of these things that you know. Then then the word started getting around. Well, oh, you did a seminar in Hopkinsville. Well, will you come to Bullet County and do one in Bullet County? So we drove to Bullet County and did a seminar there. Um, during this time period, I also, you know, in, in working with Craig Lee, and he he actually had a big, it was like a 12-passenger van, gutted the whole inside of the van, filled it with hemp stuff from top to bottom, nailed hemp pictures to the walls, he had hemp clothing hanging on, on hangers in the back of the van. The only seats in it were the driver's seat and the passenger seat. And then even those were covered with hemp fabric as upholstery. So, you know, he, he said, you know, somebody who's younger than me and with more energy than me needs to be driving this van around. So when I went to Bullock County for the seminar, that's what I drove. I drove the van out there, unloaded all the hemp stuff. We had a hemp break and, uh, and did that quite a bit. We went to Murray State University, um, went all over the state. Uh, about as far east as Lexington, and beyond that, I think it was probably a little bit too far to drive that van. But, um, but I mean, we, we even did a, a seminar here at the Red Barn um, in, in Lexington, so over at the racetrack. So we, you know, there, there was a lot of just, nobody's really pushing, pushing me to do this. Nobody is saying, you know, this is your job or, or we need you to do this. It was just get up in the morning and what am I going to do to promote this issue today? And uh, so, you know, kind of continued in that vein. Well, while all this was happening, <clears throat> we did it. We had a new commissioner of agriculture, Jamie Comer. Uh, he, he had come, like I said, 180 degrees on hemp and the issue itself. And um, he actually reinstated the Kentucky Industrial Hemp Commission which was founded in, I believe, 2001. Um, it was a, a commission made up of 18 individuals. Some were there by statute, um, by law. Other ones were appointed. And when he reinstated this commission, there were several slots on that commission that needed to be filled that were appointed by either the Speaker of the House or the President of the Senate. So um, my state rep back home, uh, John Tilley, who is a Democrat, <coughs> And Jamie Comer, who was a Republican Ag Commissioner, kind of got together and they suggested my name as a, as a uh, nominee for a House appointee. So I was uh, appointed, you know, and, and you know, I tell you whether they're Democrats or Republican because this was a completely bipartisan effort. I was uh, you know, nominated by a Democrat and a Republican. I was appointed by the Speaker of the House, Greg Stumbo. Um, you know, this was the entire political spectrum all in one place. So, you know, in our, our first com uh, hemp commission meeting, the group got together. We all decided, okay, you know, this is kind of a preliminary meeting, but here are the things we need to do. We need to start growing hemp here. We've got to pass a bill on the state level. We've got to get our federal legislators to move our feet. We've got to educate, and we've got to do some research. And the main the main issues for the Hemp Commission were um, writing legislation and doing research and kind of overseeing the hemp program um, as well as education. So, um, you know, on in the commission, um, some of the, the seats that I, or the committees that I were, were in, was in were the legislation and education committees. Those were the two big things that I was interested in. I had already spent all this time educating. Uh, I had drafted the, the hemp bill um, before we brought it to Joey Pendleton to ask for it to be sponsored. Um, so those were kind of my niches in there, and, and we did a lot of good things. We, um, we drafted a bill, a very, very good bill. We didn't get that bill, but the original, the, the heart and soul of the bill, I mean, I think most of it is there, and we do have some changes, I think, that need to be made, but, um, you know, drafted a bill, we passed something similar to that bill, and then that also gave me an opportunity to be able to work on the regulations as well. So, um, you know, we're not, we're not quite at the point where we're using state law, we're not using state regulations per se, we're all really operating under the federal gu guidelines of the federal farm bill uh, and the Ag Department. 
but we do have a framework and a structure in place where the when the federal government gets out of the way, we've already got we've now we've got three years of experience. We've got um, the structure in place and the framework, and we should be able to just take off. No no spinning the wheels. We're ready to go. So um, now. In 2014, we, we passed a bill in 2013, we spent about nine months working on the regulations. Um, so by 2014, we kind of felt like we were ready to do something with it, but we couldn't do it without the federal government moving their feet. Um, have you all heard about Mitch McConnell inserting a little clause in the farm bill that would allow us to grow hemp? That, that was actually, it was a mutual effort with Kentucky legislators in both parties, quite frankly, uh, to insert that language into the federal farm bill that would allow us to grow hemp. So here we go, we, we've got our structure in place, but we're kind of not using it because we're going by the farm bill and that says that the Department of Agriculture or a university can grow hemp for research as part of the pilot project. Okay, that's great. So what do we do? Uh, well, I actually got a phone call from Commissioner Comer at the time, and uh, he said, all right, well, we've, we've got this language in our farm bill. We, we're, we need to grow some crops. What do you think we should do? I'm like, well, it's obvious. Give a 1,000 farmers a 1,000 permits and get a 1,000 different reports, and there you go. There's all the research you need in the first year. And he's like, oh, okay, well, Katie, we, we can't exactly do that. So what, what do you think would be, you know, appropriate? Well, you know, what do you think about we grow like five acres? Okay, that sounds good. So it's like, that, that's kind of how the very beginning of the hemp program started. It's like, well, we're allowed to do this now. What should we do? Well, nobody knew because there was no experience there. You know, nobody had done it before. So, um, we started out uh, with a plan to grow five acres, maybe even up to ten, depending on how much seed we could get. And uh, we, you know, from uh, basically through a friend who brokered a seed deal for us uh, from some, for some seed from Italy, we ended up importing about 250 pounds of seed from Italy. And this was certified seed. It was seed that was grown uh, either by the Italian government or in conjunction, like a, with a seed company that was working in conjunction with the Italian government. We had our uh, all of our certificates, our documentation, our you know proof that it's lower than the THC threshold. And we thought, okay, everything is going to be great. This is perfect. Everything is legit. All our T's are crossed and our I's are dotted. And so we shipped it in from Italy um, via plane. So of course the, the seed came into Chicago, went through customs, no problem. And that's where we were really scared because we were like, oh boy, you know, customs, that's what's going to be the tough part. So it goes through customs, no problem, and we all just breathe a big sigh of relief and, and we're thinking, okay, this is going to be easy. We got through the hard part, now it's in the country. Um, so instead of shipping it directly to Frankfurt, from Chicago, uh, UPS shipped it to Louisville, where the DEA swiftly moved in and confiscated our 250 pounds of hemp seed. So, um, you know, then we're sitting here like, okay, that, that's it, you know, all we could do, being a, a grassroots, like I said, a you know, random girl from Hot Town, what's she going to do about the DEA? But what it took was the Commissioner of Agriculture taking the DEA to federal court and a judge ordering the DEA to return the seed and let us grow it because we were, everything was under federal guidelines, we were going by federal law, all of our regular, I mean, everything was in place, it was, it was ideal. Um, so, and they did. I mean, we were surprised, we were delightfully surprised because if not, I might be doing this on Skype, like from a jail cell somewhere. Um, but we were delightfully surprised, and, and uh, we were one of the few people that were successful in actually in getting seed to grow that was certified. It was cleared by the Department of Agriculture. So we ended up sharing that seed with UK and Murray State. Well, actually, Murray State had their own seed. Uh, but some of the other pilot projects around the state and the universities that wanted to grow hemp. So what we had plans to grow five to ten acres. We ended up growing 
combined total two plots of one and a half acres. At about three quarters of an acre on one plot and just about three quarters of an acre on another plot. One in the southern end of the county and one in the northern end of the county, which if you're at all familiar with Christian County, you know that's night and day. Um, so here we are, we, we grew this crop. This is the, that, that is actually the crop that you're seeing here. This crop was hijacked by the DEA at one point. So that, at least the seeds were. Um, but we, we did, we planted it, we grew it for fiber, we planted very densely, we didn't have a clue what we were doing. Um, still some might argue that we don't, but, uh, but at the time we really had no clue. We knew that farmers, uh, you know, throughout history had planted, a, you know, for fiber at densities of 40 to several hundred pounds per acre. So we just thought, okay, well, let's just dump it all in there. We'll broadcast it as, as thickly as we can. And it worked really well. Um, the, the crop varieties that we used were uh, Fibra Nova and uh, Karma 334. And they ended up being great. Uh, we, we ended up with about, one of the crops was a little bit shorter than the other one. Uh, we had the average height on the tallest crop was about 10 to 11 feet. So we had some that were a little bit taller than that, some that were a little bit shorter than that, and then the Karma 334 was a good foot or two shorter. So, But that Fiber Nova was so impressive at full height. You know, you're walking out in the field and you're reaching up to see if you can even touch the top of them, and it just really was incredible. Um, but unfortunately, I mean, we, we didn't know where to go with it for market. And quite frankly, that's why it's here today. Uh, it's been sitting in Lexington in a warehouse. Uh, once we harvested, I mean, we did the whole process as far as fiber goes. It was very labor intensive. It's how we met Kirsten and Alyssa. They came down and helped us harvest and bred it. I mean, we did the whole redding process, the shocking process. We, we stacked it up. And then once everything was dry, we turned around and we baled it in one of the big tobacco square balers that so you've got your, you know, three foot by three foot cube. And, um, and so that, you know, that was kind of the end of the life for this, this plant. We shipped it up to Lexington to GF on tobacco to see if they could do anything with it. Um, they indicated after a few test runs, they, they kind of uh, combined everybody's hemp together and did a test run and they said, well, you know, we're not really doing anything here that a farmer couldn't do with a wood chipper. So, that was it. It sat in Giafon's warehouse until the girls went and picked one up. And uh, so they, I, I'm really actually kind of excited to see them here. It's sort of like being reunited with my family. But, um, yeah, and it's bad when you start thinking of hemp as your family. But, but I definitely do. Um, so, so, you know, the, the whole process was great. It was fun. It was rewarding. We learned a lot. But that wasn't showing anybody where the markets were. It didn't prove to any farmers in the entire world that there was a, a place to sell the crop, a way to process it. Uh, it basically gave us a little hands-on experience, and I will say that you can read all the books about hemp in the world, and until you actually get out there in the dirt and start growing it, I mean, that, that's when you really learn. Um, so we knew that we needed to step up the game a little bit next year. Um, so the following year, we worked with one of the same farmers. The, the other farmer that we worked with, she actually worked in Rand Paul's office, and she knew that he was going to be pretty busy running for a higher office that year, so she kind of back, you know, stepped out of the hemp program. Um, but the, you know, the original farmer that I worked with to grow this crop, and then we um, brought on another farmer that you know, was just a fortuitous meeting. We had been running in the same circles for a few years now as I educated my you know, local community about hemp. Um, but what it took was a, for me to just randomly stop in, in his office. You know, the sign said, CBC Ag Enterprises. And I thought, Ag Enterprises, that's what I need. I need somebody who wants to be in Ag Enterprises. So I stopped in, asked uh, the manager there if he'd be interested in growing hemp or learning a little bit more about it. And he said, well, let me talk to the boss guys. And so we did. We sat down. Actually, their, their Christmas party two Christmases ago was our, our first meeting. Um, and he was a little skeptical at first. And we kind of talked about it. And he's like, well, you know, where's your market? How are you going to process it? How do we plant it? How do we harvest it? I'm like, 
well, we're kind of figuring all that out. You know, we're, we're right there. You know, we know that there's interest here, here, and here, but we're not quite sure how to get it there. And we're not quite sure how much they're going to pay. And we're not quite sure how you harvest and dry it. And pretty much all of it. But, you know, we, we really want to work together. And, and just really in listening to it and, and kind of as he became educated and, you know, you could see that little sparkle in his eyes when he would get excited about something. And then he starts asking questions. And then that opened up another avenue for questioning. And, and, and he just got more and more excited. So we started out talking about possibly growing five, five acres, that both of these farmers were going to grow five acres. And uh, the, the first farmer, he did grow five acres, um, unfortunately, and I'll, um, you know, he actually planted behind canola. And that, that's one little thing that you probably don't learn until you actually plant behind canola, but the volunteer canola will choke your hemp out until it's just a volunteer canola field. So we learned that, and, and then that was the end of his. I mean, we, you know, he planted five acres, it was gone, and what else could you do but try again next year? So, um, so we continued uh, with, with the, the first farmer, Kendall. And uh, so we had talked about growing five acres, and we figured, okay, well, here's what we're going to do with it. We kind of have an idea. Um, but then we heard that there were, you know, we thought that five acres was a good, safe, Okay, so we thought five acres was a good, safe, round number the Ag Department would approve. And then when we heard that there were other farms doing more acreage, he's like, well, we can't learn how, if it's marketable and if, there's a, you know, if it's even worth growing on five acres. So let's bump that up to 100. So he bumps it up to 100 acres, and next thing you know, we've got 100 acres of seed in the ground. Um, you know, it's growing beautifully. We had some terrible weather last year, but we managed to plant enough of it that we had something to show for it. And and those products are actually, you know, on our table right now. We've got a table over there. Uh, we harvested for seed. We started pressing the oil from the seed. Uh, I had experimented with uh, the roots and using the roots for what was historically used for arthritis pain with just phenomenal results there. Um, and, and really, you know, we've we found some markets that we never really expected. I know some of the guys that are in the back here are using some of our products. Um, and then we also, we were surprised to find that Moonshiners would be our big market. So we have had, um, I mean, they, we actually have plans for them to come back on Tuesday uh, for their third batch of the, the seed cake. Um, a thousand pounds at a time so we can't argue with that I was kind of hoping people would be getting healthy and you know aiding in digestion and you know getting that omega-3 and, and all that stuff and instead we're using it to make moonshine but there's enough there's enough for everybody I promise um, and uh, and I mean we you know everything has been an evolution we do continue to we do plan to evolve more in the future and uh, we're what our goal has always been to get the doors open, and then if if we choose to get through the doors, then you know we'll do that when the time comes. So I don't know. Is there any questions? Anybody have any questions? I know I need to. I need to get out. I get the hook. What's that? For their mash. Apparently, you can make moonshine out of anything. Yeah. Now, with bourbon and whiskey and stuff, it's a little bit different. But moonshine, apparently, you can throw some boots in there and it'll work. <laughs> there you go. Let's try that at home. Canola. Uh, it's a small, yellow, viney flower that they use. They harvest the seeds and press the seeds for oil, much the same way we do the Did you have any problems with the DEA when you had the five, first five acres growing? No. Once we got our seed, that was it. We didn't have any problems after that, aside from the foot dragging. So is it, um, like on the hip here, do they come out and test the ratios at a certain point? I know in Colorado, this is what yes. they do. Yeah, the Ag Department handles all that testing. Yeah. All right, I know Katie's super like awesome, questions. and you want to hear more from her, but... <laughs>
said, she's got her amazing Kentucky Proud Hemp products over at her booth, so when you have time, definitely go check those out. I'm going to breeze right into our next speaker today. We're really excited to have you with us, another one of our sponsors. Um, his name's John Taylor, and he's the owner of Commonwealth Extracts out of Louisville, Kentucky. And I'll let, you, I'll let him tell uh, you all more about his company and, and what his involvement is in the pilot program, but um, we're really excited about his work and his company and what he's bringing to Kentucky. So everyone give John a round of applause. Thank you, Alicia. Uh, thanks to the Hempsters for putting on these great events. Uh, I can't think of anybody else in Kentucky that's doing a better job with advocacy, education, <clears throat> and outreach with our community, which is what's desperately needed if we're going to overcome some of the hurdles that uh, were put in place about 80 years ago. I want to read this to you, and I don't know if uh, any of you have ever had a chance to read this, but what this is is an abstract from the U.S. Patent. And in the abstract, abstract it says, Cannabinoids have been found to have antioxidant properties unrelated to MDMA receptor antagonism. This newfound property makes cannabinoids useful in the treatment and phylaxis of a wide variety of oxidation-associated diseases such as isemic age-related inflammatory and autoimmune diseases. The cannabinoids are found to have particular application as neuroprotectants, for example, in limiting neurological damage following isemic insults such as stroke and trauma or in the treatment of neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and HIV dementia. The non-psychoactive cannabinoids such as cannabidiol are particularly advantageous for use because they avoid toxicity that is, that is entered with psychoactive cannabinoids in high doses. And it presents a considerable useful in the method of the present invention. What this present invention is, is it's the United States government patent on cannabis oil. It's owned by the Department of Health and Human Services. And this was issued in 2004. And what this document says in great detail is what the medical benefits of cannabis are, including cannabidiol. Now, everybody knows the THC is toxic, and one of the bad things when administering a medicine is that you don't want to make the patient so overwhelmed or hallucinate that they can't feel better. And obviously, the goal of medicine is to make people feel better. I start out by reading that pattern because most people that I talk to just simply aren't aware that there's been an extensive amount of research when it comes to cannabinoids and their helpful properties in aiding the human body to heal itself. Uh, I found this out personally when about nine years ago my daughter started finding me flopping in the floor with grand mal seizures. Um, my life was on a downward spiral because of epilepsy and seizures. I was having them every two to three months uh, with no relief um, until one day they found me in a beer cooler about three blocks from my house at four o'clock in the morning in my underwear. And after the dragnet was formed and the police figured out where I was, and they came and got me. I had three broken ribs and a black eye. And I went back to my doctor and he said, well, Mr. Taylor, that's, that's real. I see what happened and I see that uh, the 18 pills you're taking a day aren't working. Let's kick that up to 22. So let's see how that works. Let's try that for a little while. And then if that doesn't work, we'll try 28. And that was really the only relief I found through traditional medicine, uh, anticonvulsants, antipsychotics. Uh, the body is not meant to function on phenobarbital, dilantin, lamictal, a lot of the other very heavy uh, cures. I wouldn't use the word cure. It's a symptomatic treatment that doctors typically prescribe for individuals suffering from seizures. Um, I told him he was crazy with a few other expurlatives that I'm not going to say right here now, and I'll be polite and professional, but he told me to leave his office got quite upset with me after cussing profanely. Uh, but that was the beginning of me educating myself. And it was shortly after that I discovered the U.S. patent. I reached out to some friends uh, in Oregon and became aware that there are some alternatives that do exist and that those alternatives can provide a much better patient outcome than watching your liver deteriorate, your teeth fall out, your hair fall out, which that was going to happen anyway. Uh, <laughs> All of the other things. I mean, I was literally the walking definition of all of the side effects. Uh, probably wouldn't have lived 10 to 12 years longer given the regimen and the deterioration of my body with the, the 
drugs that I was prescribed. Um, it's really been a breath of fresh air. Um, I was asymptomatic for five years. I had stopped having seizures entirely. And then when I went to a seizure monitoring unit after I'd been using cannabis oil for about six months, they detoxed me and they put me on to an EEG. And after five days, they could not induce a seizure. And the one young doctor at the University of Louisville came up to me and said, Mr. Taylor, are you sure you've ever had one of these? So it really has been a journey. Now, you, know, you fast forward six years later, and I had the great benefit to meet Ms. Katie Moyer in Christian County. We took a trip out, and I became educated in the hemp program in Kentucky, and Katie was one of the leading advocates at the time who put me in contact with a lot of people in this, this great network we have in our state. And one of the things that we were able to deduce from the very beginning is that there is no means of production. CBD is a compound that's developed in the trichromes of the plant that has to be extracted and concentrated. That involves hardware technology that just simply was not present at the time in our state. So being the entrepreneur that I am, uh, I was currently at the time running another business and it gave me the freedom and leeway and uh, the financial wherewithal to begin exploring this new business venture. Um, I brought the idea to my partner who at the time looked at me squarely in the eye and says, I'll do this if we can help these kids. I'll do this and I'll put the money up and you and me can do this if we can put the relief in the hands of the people that need it. And at the same time help the farmers who grow these plants. So that's what Commonwealth Extracts was born out of. A, an observation of the marketplace, a, a recognition that there is a significant need for this infrastructure and we were blessed enough to get accepted. Um, you know, Katie hit the nail on the head that the people who are in charge are the ones that are out there doing the work and being a leader doesn't mean you have all the answers. It means you have the courage to get up and do something, even if it's anything. And that's a long, painful process that sometimes people are fearful to begin, but I can assure you that you know, I, I use this saying with, with all of our farmers. By the time this program's over, we'll know exactly what we're doing. And I kind of say that with a smile because you have to laugh. There's some things that are incredibly painful to learn. You don't learn unless you get out there and do them. And it is the process of having those scrapes and bruises and bumps that hone us into the edge that becomes an effective tool in creating solutions. So Commonwealth Extracts was founded on a simple principle that we need an extraction facility that can bring a scale of economics to this marketplace that currently does not exist in any state. Uh, Western states who have mer medical marijuana laws do have extraction facilities, but they're all microprocessors. Um, we came at this that we want to be able to process thousands, if not ten thousands, tens of thousands of pounds of product a day to drive the cost down to fractions of a penny. That is how you create patient advocacy through affordability. You don't create small batch microprocesses that keeps the, play, the price high. You flood the market. You have hundreds of farmers growing the product that we need to process. I'm kind of rambling on a bit. We don't grow our own plant. We rely heavily on farmers. That is kind of the heart of our cooperative model, that without farmers doing what they do best, we don't have any product to process. And so, as Katie mentioned before, I'm going to tag on her line, that there was no processing capacity. And so when the farmers came to us and said, we can grow this, we can grow anything, where do you sell it, who do you sell it to, what form does it go in, what's the current market price, wholesale, retail, these are all things that we can help and what we recognized our skill set was is we can answer those questions. Uh, in the process of becoming ill, I learned how to extract the oil. I traveled out west extensively for my own health, and I learned the art of extraction. I learned to do ethanol, uh, traditional ethanol extraction, and I upgraded to fluid extraction, which provides a cleaner and safer alternative because it uses carbon dioxide as opposed to traditional solvents like methanol, ethanol, butanol, hexane, methane, uh, typical hydrocarbon solvents. So we really wanted to provide Kentucky and again, blessed to, to be in the program. But together we will 
make the solutions for this state. We don't have all the answers. I'm real quick to say that. And I love talking to some of my older farmers who have probably forgotten more than I'll ever know when it comes to farming. We have everything that we need in this state to make this happen. The tobacco agronomic model is ideally suited for cannabinoid growth and development. It is just like tobacco. We plant fewer, bigger plants per acre. We harvest using the same sticks. We hang them in the same barns. Uh, we just had our first go around with carousel setters, setting our plugs out in the field. Uh, this strain that we were able to bring, I think, is one of the economic drivers because of its feasibility in our marketplace. Now we're still waiting on the final test results. Of course, we have to adhere to a 0.3 THC standard, and that's a very difficult animal when dealing with cannabinoids because you're essentially playing with fire without trying to get burnt. And that is the science. So we acquired a strain that produces about 10% CBD while still being federally compliant at THC levels. Uh, the growth initially in the greenhouses looks phenomenal. The first field settings, which have been in ground about 12 days now, uh, are growing like a weed. They're about a foot tall. And we look like we're going to be able to do some very effective things in this marketplace this year. Um, it's easy for me to stand here and say that three years later, having been through what we've been through, but hindsight's always 2020. You know, they say uh, the ship is safe to sit in a harbor, but ships weren't meant to sit in a harbor. And that's kind of something we take as we go forward. It, um, I have to commend our Department of Agriculture. I know they get a lot of grief, and I was talking to them about that earlier. They probably get way more angry phone calls than they do people saying, thank you so much for everything that you're doing. But it is their work and the leadership uh, of former Commissioner Comer, Commissioner Quarles. Everybody has come together on this, and I've never seen anything divide political partisanship. I've never seen anything in my life, and, and I'm so thankful to be a part of it, that everybody can agree that Kentucky needs an industry Kentucky needs an economic driver, and whether you're on you know, up or down, right or left, most people can agree that better well-paying jobs, better economic improvement benefits everybody. There's just no if, ands, or buts about it, and there are several great leaders in this new industry that are working very, very hard to advance that by nothing other than their spirit and their passion. Uh, I don't know of anybody that has a degree in cannabis production. I don't know of anybody that has a, a doctorate in supercritical fluid extraction. I've met him, I'm going to meet with him tomorrow. Um, he wants to come here and help us because of the great things that we're doing. He's very, very excited about the network, coalition, our administrative environment, to be able to produce a facility that's large enough to produce some economies of scale. It's astounding when you look at the nationwide hemp movement, how far ahead our state is right now. It is leaps and bounds, and no matter what other issues may be going on, everybody has some problems. I know we've got a budget deficit, and uh, we need some cash in our pension fund. But I think if we focus on what's important, creating income drivers, creating industry, putting people to work, then those other things can be worked out in time, quite easily, in fact. There's a huge tax base that's going to be growing, and by Con University of Kentucky Department of Economics' own evaluation, whichever state creates the infrastructure and the mechanisms first, that will be the state that leads this country and the rest of the world in this new economic and agronomic development. There's no other place in the world like Kentucky when it comes to growing this plant. We have, we have the honey hole. We have the magic combination of soil, sun, water, and I learned firsthand by being in Colorado last year uh, that it's a desert and water costs you five times what the land costs. So not many agronomic models other than marijuana's current upswing will ever be supported in that type of environment. So let's take advantage of what we have, great people. Let's take advantage of 
all of what the Lord has given us here as far as our region and our environment, and let's make the most of it. That's kind of what we built our company on. And, uh, the other thing is I'm happy to talk with any farmer that's interested in growing him. We can provide the genetics for you to produce as long as you're a licensed grower. We want to talk to you. We want to help educate you on how to get in the program, how to make you a well-qualified candidate. So if anybody wants to speak with me after this in regard to your farm or if you're interested in being a producer, we're always looking to recruit. So uh, that's my speech. I didn't have anything formally written out. If, does anybody have any questions? I wanted to leave a little bit of time for some questions and answers. Yeah. So yeah. Um, in your extraction, I suppose you all using DHO. No, we don't use butane. I'm not a fan of butane. Okay, CO2 or PHO? Yes. Or carbon? See, uh, carbon dioxide is the solvent. Yeah. BHO or butane extraction is it's the volatility that makes me nervous. Yeah, exactly. uh, it can be managed, but there's just some things. I feel like I, I live in Colorado and I'm in the industry there. Uh, I feel like the PHO and the, uh, and the CO2 is a cleaner product also. We're getting around 25%, well, 23 to 25% return mm -hmm. on um, our extractions. There you go. Is it basically the same out the end, or is it running way lower? Or? Well, uh, last year we had to make lemonade. We uh, didn't have the strain that we wanted. We processed and extracted strain, um, seed and fiber varieties mostly. We were happy to get what we worked with. We processed some of the canda that Katie and Kendall grew in Christian County. We grew some, processed some finola, uh, some futura. A high CBD strain is not like a fiber or grain crop. It is very specifically grown for cannabinoid production. You only use the female, you prevent pollination. Uh, we didn't have any of that in place last year. Our yields were horrible. It was, um, well, it's a great learning experience. That's a good way to put it. Uh, well, Colorado, you have to supplement it. That, that was one small issue. The, the initial flower that I'm waiting on, <coughs> I feel will be in the range of what we consider acceptable. 15 to 20 percent would be ideal. CO2 always gets less yield because it's not as stringent of a solvent. We trade off yield for safety and cleanliness. Okay, so are y'all doing more of a live extraction or dry? We haven't done live extraction yet. We do, do, we do dry. Um, there are some new pieces of equipment I'm looking to get that aren't in place yet, but right now it's just dry extraction with supercritical fluid. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, ma'am? Is there a program in place that don't contact the old tobacco bed farmers and say, hey, we have an option here if you're willing to get on board with us? Has anybody looked at an idea of what else to the ag department itself? Because I know they kept reducing the amount of um, tobacco base. The agriculture department has actually been quite helpful and they haven't necessarily set us up with direct tobacco bed farmers. One of my greatest resources has actually been um, Facebook, the internet, uh, reaching out through different blogs and individuals online who have the interest. Um, I have way more people who are interested right now than we're actually able to help. Now, that's changing. Uh, we've made a lot of headway this year and that we were able to turn 100 mother plants into 240,000 clones in five months. And now that that's been achieved, we'll have enough mother stock for next year.